Hello and welcome to worship the fourth Sunday after Epiphany here with Atonement Lutheran Church. Very glad that you joined us, whether you are a member of the congregation or just tuning in. Um, thank you so much for this time together. I invite you to join me in gathering our hearts and our minds for worship. Please join in confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people, whose goodness cascades over all creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away, and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion that all creation will see and know you are present. In Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The first reading for this fourth Sunday after Epiphany is from Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb, on the day of the assembly, when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. The psalm for this day is Psalm 111. Hallelujah! I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are your works, O Lord, pondered by all who delight in them. Majesty and splendor mark your deeds, and your righteousness endures forever. You cause your wonders to be remembered. You are gracious and full of compassion. You give food to those who fear you, remembering forever your covenant. You have shown your people the power of your works, in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of your hands are faithfulness and justice. All of your precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever, because they are done in truth and equity. You sent redemption to your people and commanded your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice this have a good understanding. God's praise endures. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians, the 8th chapter. 
Now concerning food sacrifice to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by God. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel for the fourth Sunday after Epiphany is according to Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O God. Jesus and the disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out. And they were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once Jesus' fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Just then, just then, there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. It was as if this unnamed man suddenly appeared. Aside from having an unclean spirit, we know nothing about this man. We don't know where he's come from, where he lives, what he looks like, or even his name. And it's highly unlikely that this man just suddenly appeared in the synagogue. Somebody had to have seen him. It's as if this unclean spirit in him makes him camouflaged into the background. It makes this man unrecognizable, unknowable, unseeable. Is that it is as if this unclean spirit causes him to be invisible. He's the character in the story that's always lurking around in the background. He sees the story happening. He's witnessing and watching everything unfold. He's always present and never invited into the story. This unclean spirit makes this man unrecognizable. He becomes invisible to his society. He is there. He is very much present, but nobody bothers to see him. To have an unclean spirit attached to you assumes that there's possession. 
you're possessed by something. And our unnamed man is assumed to be controlled by something other than himself. There's a part of him that doesn't seem human. In giving this man an unclean spirit but not a name, his community has successfully dehumanized him. They have made him into the other. The other thing, something that is to be feared, something that you cannot see, and something you don't want to see. Just then, there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. He cries out. The man with an unclean spirit cries out to Jesus. The unclean spirit says, Jesus of Nazareth, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. And it's in this thin moment that Jesus is able to see beyond the unclean spirit and see a man, a human, a beloved person suffering and in pain. And so when that unclean spirit cries out to Jesus, there is an assumption that that spirit or that man was begging for help. That unclean spirit knew who Jesus was. It said, Jesus of Nazareth, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. And there was power in that statement. There is power given to Jesus in recognizing you are the Holy One of God. You hold great power. So why would an unclean spirit call out to Jesus? In that moment, Jesus immediately silences the spirit. Because there is authority in naming a person and in recognizing someone. So Jesus silences the spirit and casts them away. Jesus takes that power and control and releases the spirit from the man. And the listeners, they weren't just amazed and astounded by Jesus' words. That's not what caught their attention. It was this action, the casting away of a spiritual being. So in that moment, Jesus' ministry went from being about just giving informative ministry, it changed into transformative. Jesus didn't stand there and he didn't question the man with an unclean spirit. He didn't ask, like, do you really need money? Are you really living on the streets? How do I know this spirit is unclean? How do I know this is real? Jesus doesn't do that. He hears the cry of the oppressed And he listens, and he witnesses to it, and he says, yes, this is real, this is happening. This spirit is causing pain to this person. And the story, Jesus' ministry, begins, and it becomes transformative. It becomes a process of healing. Now, in our community today, we are surrounded with unclean spirits, with people we see as unholy or people we say are unworthy of God's love. They're the people who are invisible to us as we pass by them on the streets in our life and in our community. They are often people suffering from injustice. Very much so, the unclean spirits of our world are, it is white supremacy and climate change, it is racism and so on. It is all the forces in this world that prohibit us from loving our neighbor as ourself, that prohibit us from welcoming the stranger into our community. Those are the unclean spirits. And so often, Those unnamed people, like this man in the story, are those experiencing injustice. They are those who are being crushed by oppressive bills and laws. It it is our LGBTQIA plus children 
It is those who are threatened to not have a home because they are a stranger in this land. In the moments where we fail to create safe spaces for God's beloved to exist, we become possessed, we become controlled by unclean spirits. And Jesus, in our story today, is calling us, calling us into transformative ministry. And that's a process. Because healing, real healing, is a process. It happens one step at a time. Our challenge today is to say, yes, unclean spirits exist. Because we as a community can't act as Jesus did in silencing the unclean spirit and casting it away until we first recognize it and we believe it and we say, yes, it exists in our world. Jesus' ministry was not just informative. It was transformative. It was about embodying God's bold love in word and in action. The call for unity and healing have long echoed in our society. And right now, that echo is getting louder and louder. We are in a position where our society is feeling the strain of tension. People are hurting. They're isolated. So much so that unity and healing may seem impossible in this moment. But if we're able to take it one step at a time, it just might be possible. Unity and healing will not happen in one day. Jesus' ministry, thanks be to God, did not end with this healing. He didn't get to just heal one person and be done. Unity and healing will happen. And it begins when we can move together one step at a time. If we can hear the cries and, the, and accept the reality of our world, from there we can continue to take action in silencing the unclean spirit and casting them away. Because we are called into Jesus' transformative ministry we're called to hear the cries of the press, to recognize the unclean spirits causing agony, and to give name to those suffering from the unclean spirits, and to give power back to those afflicted. Jesus' ministry wasn't just informative. It moved beyond his words. Jesus' ministry became transformative. It became about embodying God's love and acting out God's love in this world. We are being invited into that calling today. It is a bold and it is a courageous calling and it is scary, but if we take it one step at a time, if we give ourselves grace and room to breathe, we can take it one step at a time. And then we can take the next step and we can realize the reality of this world. And we can name those unclean spirits and then that's the second step. And then we can continue this process of healing over and over again, step by step by step. God is with us in that process. God is inviting us into that process. God is inviting us to recognize that unnamed person that is suffering from unclean spirits. Because there was a man with us in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. He was there already. So may we continue to witness Jesus' transformative ministry. May we continue to be pushed to act out of love and compassion. May we hear the cries of the oppressed. May we name those suffering under unclean spirits. And may we give power back to the afflicted. May we heal one step at a time. And thanks be to God that grace and love is a process. Amen.
Let us pray. Guided by Christ made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For all who share the gospel and proclaim freedom in Christ throughout the world, prophets, teachers, pastors, deacons, lay leaders, for the church and its ministries, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For all God's works in creation, plants and animals, water and soil, forests and farms, and for those tasked with protecting our natural resources in all that exists, let us pray, have mercy, O God. For government and leaders, cities and nations, rescue professionals and legal aid attorneys, elected officials and grassroots organizers, for all responsible for the well-being of civil society, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit, those who are sick and hospitalized, those living with HIV AIDS, those struggling with mental illness, especially now, those who are hungry or homeless, and all in any need. For caregivers, hospice workers, and home health aides, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For the concerns of this congregation, those who are isolated, those longing for in-person worship, those celebrating birthdays or anniversaries, for the people of God in this place and for other needs in our community, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For the covenant God made with us in the waters of baptism, in thanksgiving for the baptized who have died in Jesus, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Amen. Let us pray for the offering received. O oh God, Receive these gifts as you receive us, like a mother receives her child with arms open wide. Nourish us anew in your tender care, and empower us in faithful service to tend to others with this same love. Through Jesus Christ, our saving grace. Amen. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who comforted your people with the promise of the Redeemer, through whom you will also make all things new in the day when he comes to judge the world in righteousness. And so, with the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy God, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are they who come in the name of God. Hosanna in the highest. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. God, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
Let us pray. Christ Jesus, at this table we have feasted on your very life and are strengthened for our journey. Send us forth from this banquet, nourished in body and in spirit, to proclaim your good news and serve others in your name. Amen. And receive this blessing. God the Creator, strengthen you. Jesus the Beloved, fill you. And the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, keep you in peace. Amen. Go in peace, you are a city on a hill, a lamp on a stand. Thanks be to God. Amen.